Yes, we can hear you. Alhamdulillah. Okay. Okay. وصلي الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته with the will of Allah jalla wa ala subhanahu wa ta'ala we will continue with our journey through um the minhaj al abidin of imam al ghazali rahimahullah azza wa jalla and we've explained at the very beginning of our journey that Yani the book of Imam al-Ghazali is his last book. And we also said that the approach amongst scholars differ with regards to getting closer to Allah Jalla And in our last class, we said that there was Tariqat al-Mujahada and Tariqat al-Mushahada or Tariqat al-Ubbad and Tariqat al-Arifin and that they meet in the middle. Then we uh, read together what Imam Ghazali said about the path to Allah Jalla and how difficult the path in reality is and that only the minority of the people want to yani, walk on the path and the minority of those who want to will do so and the minority of those who do will eventually reach their final destination which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let's continue and, and see what Imam al-Ghazali uh, says with regards to what? With regards to traveling the path. He says the introduction to the guidance to the path of worship. Indeed, the first thing that awakens a servant of God for worship, any, and so he takes initiative to take this path, is divine inspiration. And the divine and special enablement, and this is what is meant by the, by God's words. أَفَمَنْ شَرَحَ اللَّهُ صَدْرَهُ لِلْإِسْلَامِ فَهُوَ عَلَى نُورٍ مِنْ رَبِّهِ Can the misguided be like those whose hearts Allah has opened to Islam, so they are enlightened by their God? So now, barakallahu fikum, the what Imam Ghazali rahimahullah here says is that being guided either to Islam or to a correct comprehension of Islam or to practice of Islam is God-given. It is not something that you can force Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you. No? And very often it is he who opens, opens your heart. Like uh, many a man or many a woman was not even thinking of drawing close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, was not even thinking of connecting to Allah Jalla wa ala or uh, memorizing the Quran or just being a good Muslim. And then all of a sudden your heart is open. It is like you, for the first time in your life, you feel with your heart, you think with your heart, you, you move with your heart. So um, the bearer of God's divine law alluded to this and he said, Verily, if the light entrance enters the heart, the heart broadens and opens up. Then it was said, O Messenger of God, is there for that a sign through which that can be known? He responded, distancing from the abode of deception, turning to abode of eternity, and preparing for death before the arrival of death. So in this hadith, our Messenger Muhammad وسلم, speaks about light. It is the light of understanding, it is the light of of, of, of wanting, the light of yearning, the light of loving, the light of caring for your path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are actually three things through which you can recognize whether someone has this light or rather where you can recognize how strong your light is. Very often you want to know, am I doing okay? Well, look at three things. Look at three things and they will tell you whether you're okay. Compare your striving for your eternal life with your striving for your temporarily one. 
<laughs> so, so, so look at that. Look at how much you give of yourself and your time and your breath for this one and the other. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ clearly stated, he said, yani someone who wants dunya will harm his akhirah, and someone who wants akhirah will harm his dunya. So, so this is this is how it works. And now the thing is that Imam Ali radiallahu anhu wa ardahu wa karrama wajahahu, yani he said, yani dunya has children and akhirah has children. Be from amongst the children of akhirah, not amongst the children of dunya. He said, and how strange is it to see that people run away from that which escapes from them and, uh, oh, sorry, run away from that which they cannot escape and run towards that which they will never be able to catch up with, <laughs> dunya and akhirah. And they run away from that which they can't escape, which is the akhirah. And they run, to, they run behind that which they will never be able to catch up with, which is the dunya. Every time you have dunya, dunya tells you to that there is more. So keep on running. Huh? So Muhammad Ali Sallam, and he made this clear. And then the third thing is what is ti'adari lil mauti qabla nuzulin maut, and that you prepare for death, yani before death comes upon you. Then, first of all, it occurs to the heart of the slave that indeed I find myself bestowed with many types of blessings, such as life, strength, intellect, articulation and the rest of the praiseworthy noble attribute, attributes and delights. While types of harm and afflictions have been deflected from me, verily for these blessings there is the one who bestows, who enjoys upon me to thank him and to serve him. Look, now Imam al-Ghazali says that just by logical thinking, just by thinking logically, you will eventually come to the draw come to the conclusion that there must be someone i mean you you can't have a blessing without someone bestowing that blessing upon you you can't have a gift without someone giving you that gift and he says look now when you look at the face of the earth i mean everything i want you now as well to look around you everything you see nothing of that is solely man-made. It is man-shaped. Uh, I mean, not creation. I mean, everything which doesn't have a soul. Everything you see is man-shaped. It's not man-made. I don't believe in man-made. I believe in man-shaped. Because everything, even that which we chemically yani, uh, manipulated, but everything we use comes from the face of the earth. Even when it goes through th so many different processes every and turns into something new, which we don't find in nature, like plastic, for example, or they say that some kind of plastic does exist. But anyway, so you will find that they only existed the ingredients which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them. So now who gave these ingredients? So we can't escape from, from God's ble blessings. Everything we see, everything we hear, <laughs> everything, even, even the sounds you hear now, even though that it are not sounds which were, um, uh, we, which are transmitted by creation, yani which was created by Allah subhanahu wa with the soul, but it is nevertheless the sound of something which reminds us of a bestower, of a blessing. Like even when you hear a car, you hear a plane. I mean, all the ingredients were given and we just sculptured. We didn't make anything because even that which we made was inspired by the maker, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he says, so if you were to walk yani, over the face of the earth and you wouldn't have these distractions, and especially today, yani, the atheist uh, way of thinking, which is almost imposed um, uh, or, or forced upon us, I mean, movies and in in, in songs and, and, and just in general, in politics and so much more. But if, if a human being would be left alone, then he would know by logic that there is a creator. Um, I mean, everything shows that there is somebody 
or that there was somebody. So what about creation? So this is the first thing. So he says, I find myself bestowed with many types of blessings, such as life, strength, intellect, articulation, and the rest of the praiseworthy noble attributes and delights, while types of harm and affliction have been deflected from me. For him, that's also another, another sign. None when you are born, some people are born, born blind, others are not, Other, uh, others are blind but can hear, Other, others can hear but they are not blind, others are blind and can't hear and others can do both. So you see that the blessings you do have, although that you have some afflictions and shortcomings or, or def deficiencies or flaws or maybe uh, yani a, a handicap, for example, that, that you're d disabled in a certain kind of way, Nevertheless, there's still a lot of blessings going on there, a lot. And our scholars say the greatest blessing is the mind, is the aql. The greatest blessing, because this is through which a human being distinguishes himself from others. Um, and when they say stop acting like an animal, they mean stop acting like someone who can't control his behavior. Um, so we... Because animals on, on their own, they are not bad. Now, even if they kill you, they're not bad animals. They just do what they do. That's what they were created for, to, you know, to attack and hunt and, and kill down its, and, and hunt down its prey and kill it and eat. Now, but the human being, and he has this aql. And one plus one is two. I see a blessing. I don't see anybody from the human beings having blessed me with it. So there is somebody else. And that somebody else is doing it for everybody because we share these blessings. So this is what he's saying. So verily for these blessings, there is the one who bestows, who enjoins uh, upon me to thank him and to serve him. Why? How can he come to this conclusion? Is because when somebody gives you something, it is normal that you are going to thank that someone. No? You, you are not going to just accept a gift and just don't look at the person and don't say thank you. So he says, well, now... I have all these blessings which I am using and because water is not mine, it was there before me. <laughs> the food, animals are not mine, they were there, there before me, I didn't create them, I didn't shape them. So now I know that you know, I, I have been given these gifts by someone I can't see. So that someone that I can't see, I don't know how to call him, but I know he's there. I know that there is someone and as he and he is giving me this much, then I, one, have to thank him, and I will serve him. Why? Because I also know that if he can give me these blessings, I also know that he can take away these blessings. And I don't want to disappoint him. I don't even know any him, but I know he's there. So you see how Imam al-Ghazali, just through logical thinking, takes us to the conclusion that there is someone. There is someone. The universe shows us there, that there is someone. The stars, the moon, the sun, they show us that there is someone. Every, every species amongst the animals show us that there is someone taking care of them, forming them, shaping them, uh, coloring them, yani, figuratively speaking, and in giving them a shape and a structure, and their hair structure is different. Um, so their skin is different, their, their, their form is different, subhanAllah, showing that there is uh, somebody taking care of them, designing them, forming them, shaping them, creating them, teaching them how to survive and how to live, either driven by instinct or either being protected by logic think logical thinking, which is the human being. So he said, who enjoys upon me to thank him and to serve him, if I pay no heed to doing that, he will remove his blessings from me and he will make me taste his torment and punishment. Now, how does he come to torment and punishment, right? Because you're still thinking. You're walking in that jungle far away from all the false impressions of life and of, 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 of ma manipulative factors which, which change your original way of thinking as a human being. No? Because as a human being, you, you would draw these conclusions without any doubt. So, well, he looks at the way the world works. Um, he, he, he looks at uh, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the tsunamis, at the earthquakes, and so much more. So he knows that there is a mover, and that this mover can be angry, like he can destroy with rain 
many a man's land, and he can sprinkle many a man's land and making it one, turning it into a, a garden, almost resembling the gardens of Eden with its beauty and beautiful flowers and perfumes and smells uh, and, and so much more. So you are going, and, and colors. So he, he sees that rain can do exactly the two opposites, meaning that rain on its own is not the power. If rain comes down and it can make plants grow and, uh, and allows me to wash myself back in the days. But on the other hand, it can all also destroy any agriculture and, 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 and lands and so much more, then there is somebody who is doing that. There is somebody doing that. And that someone does then have can be pleased and can also be what be angry with someone. So all of this yani, is very logical and rational thinking and a very yani, very rational approach to things. He says, verily, he has sent me a messenger and aided him with inimitable miracles beyond the customs of human capacity. Um, so now he says, like, okay, all of this has been created. So it's it's clear that he is the king. So that's the next conclusion. He is the king of all this universe, and he is my king, and the king of everybody, because he's treating everybody in that same way. Yani, for, for, for the, the, the basics are the same. So I, I'm not the one that makes the wind blow. I'm not the one that makes it rain. I'm not the one that uh, that, that 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 is the reason for high tide and low tide. I'm not the one that turns day into night and night into day. I'm not even the one who knows how I do my own breathing how I blink my eye, <laughs> how I sleep, how I, I don't know, how I digest my food. It has been observed, but I don't know how I do it. It, had been, it has been described, but I'm not the one doing it. It's just happening. So yani, it's very clear that there is a king, and every king yani, wants something from you. So there must be people who are God-sent, telling me how to please that king. And how to stay away from his anger. Because I don't know what makes him angry. And I don't know what pleases him. So there must be, there has to be, a messenger sharing this with me. And then, you know, after believing in that God, and after looking for that messenger, we only find Muslim messengers. Meaning, people, all the people, or the majority of people who said that they were messengers... They are the ones who were sent by God Almighty, being it Nuh or Ibrahim, or the Musa, Isa, and Muhammad, وسلم, and all the other ones. And they all say the same. You have one Lord. You have one God. Oh, they are affirming what I already believed. But they are coming with details which I wouldn't have known because I am not the one who is in contact, direct contact with that one who is providing for me, who is guiding me, who is giving me, but they are. And they are sharing with me from the world unseen a message which allows me to please the one who is taking care of me, who to stay away from the anger of the one who has shaped me and formed me. And they say themselves, we are the messengers of that one that you have already believed in. So believe in us so that your correct belief and so that you will believe correctly in the one you believe in. So he, that messenger, has told me that I have a Lord. Glorious is he, his remembrance, who is all powerful, all qadir, all knowing, the living, the per the, the purpose, a speaker, the one who commands and prohibits, who is able to punish me if I disobey him and reward me if I obey him. And I already knew after my logical thinking that he can be angry and he can give mercy. If I obey him, he is well aware of my secrets and that which occupies my thoughts. He has promised and threatened. He has commanded to adhere to the sacred laws which occurs to the heart that this is possible because there is no absurdity in that according to the intellect as a first instinctive reaction. Thus he fears for himself and feels frightful. And he, 
nothing of what we have said goes against logic. Nothing. Because they say, but you can't see it. I do. Everything which is make, made shows us that there is a maker. So let's stop. <laughs> let's stop doing that. You're on the face of the earth, and you even don't know how to make it rain. All the songs are about make it rain, and then they talk about making yani, making <laughs> it rain money. Uh, turn turn night into day and day into night, and I I will I will hold you high in esteem. But as you are not able to do that, the only one I hold high in esteem in that kind of way is Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So now we continue. If it is this thought of fear which awakens the slave and enjoins upon him to seek proof. He is removed from any excuse and is distressed by it. So he investigates and seeks clear proof, burning with passion to do that. The servant worries and investigates the path to victory and acquiring protection for himself or from what has occurred in his heart or what he has heard with his ears. Hmm. So what he's saying is, like the first step is you believe it, and then you have the people confirming that belief. That is how it would originally go. But as we said, the Prophet ﷺ said, كل مولود يولد على الفطرة. Every human being is born with the fitrah. Yani the inclinement to believe, the inclination to believe in a maker because of the aql which guides him to that. And the most un illogical thing is not to believe that there is a maker of everything you see from which you know that nobody has ever claimed to be the maker of it. Even Pharaoh, he didn't say, Pharaoh, he didn't say, I made the sun, I made the moon. People would say, man, I'm sorry, but I was there before you. And the sun was there and the moon, the moon was shining <laughs> during the night and the sun was shining, shining bright during the day. So they knew that he wasn't the maker of it. And, and he said, I'm your Lord. He didn't say, I'm your maker. So subhanAllah, he spoke about ilah. Yani, I am the one you need to worship. I am your highest Lord, yani, your highest God. But, yani, but he never said, I am your maker, I am your shaper, I am the creator of the universe. SubhanAllah, Ajib. He finds no path except to investigate, I'm oh, sorry. He finds no path except to investigate with his intellect, drawing conclusions reached by reasoning from the creation about the creator to acquire certain knowledge in relation to the unseen. So he knows that he has a God who has placed obligations on him and commanded him and prohibited him. The obstacles of the path of worship. Now, the obstacle of knowledge. So now Imam Ghazali is speaking about the obstacles. Now, because now you, you came to the conclusion that God exists. Now and that he can be angry with you and that he can be pleased with you so now you know that no? so after this he has messengers who tell you what to do and what not to do so now yani they, they, they in general they say please your lord and don't displease him so now you say okay how am i going to do this now because he's from the world yani i can't see him i can't hear him the prophets can so they I need to learn now from them how to please him and how not to displease him. So the first obstacle on your way to pleasing the one and to worshipping the one and to stay away from displeasing the one is worship, uh, is knowledge. So he says the obstacle of the path of worship because you want to worship him. Worshipping meaning serving him, the one subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the first obstacle obstacle to face in the pathway to worship and it is the obstacle of knowledge and perception so that the servant can perceive the matter with penetrative insight thus he begins okay my apologies um, so does he begin tra uh, tra traversing or traversing? I don't, how, 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 where do we put the emphasis, uh, Khayyam? 
Thus he begins traversing. 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 Thus he begins traversing he, this path by taking a good look at the evidences, abundant reflection and study, asking the scholars of the hereafter who are the leaders of the pathway, lanterns of the nation and the head of the leaders. So, um, Okay. So he says, thus he begins traversing his path by taking a good look at the evidences, abundant reflection and study, asking the scholars of the hereafter, who are the leaders of the pathway, the lanterns of the nation, and the head of the leaders. So here he mentions, you should know that Imam al-Ghazali, and he was a scholar. What you need to know is that scholars never, ever, ever mention words without intending them, okay? So meaning that everything he mentions here is intended. So when he says, Yani, a good look at the evidence, evidences, abundant reflection and study and asking the scholars, that means that these are the four things one needs to do to, to, um, to what? To traverse the path or the obstacle of, of, of knowledge. So, Yani, one of them, I'm I'm sorry, life doesn't stop. Okay, Okay, Bismillah, I continue. I'm so sorry, um, life doesn't stop, so these things are normal. Um, so, uh, Alhamdulillah, no problem. Um, so he mentions all of these things. So he says, have a good look at the evidences, yani mean Quran and Sunnah, abundant reflection, and then study, and asking the scholars of the hereafter. So even when you study on your own, you are uh, not entitled to draw your own conclusions unless you have all the um, instruments which are necessary for you to understand the Quran and the Sunnah correctly. No? And then he says, the scholars of the hereafter who are the leaders of the pathway, the lanterns of the nation and the head of the leaders. And, and the, why does he say the scholars of the hereafter? Because when you travel your path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you, you want to ask the scholars of the hereafter. Why? Because everybody has his own, um, his own speciality, his own expertise. And when you want to travel to the path of the hereafter, you're not going to ask a faqih. When you want to know how to fly, you're not going to ask a train uh, driver. Now you're going, to, you're going to ask a pilot. So, and this is what he's saying. So we are talking about the hereafter now. So ask the scholars of the hereafter. Who are the scholars of the hereafter? Well, they have many traits. But the most important traits they have can be divided into five categories. Five. Now, the, there are five main traits. And one of them is rahma. Now, is compassion. And compassion is a trait of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They have siddiq, meaning they're genuine. They do munilith. They do things for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa taala, with a sincere intention. And this is the trait of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. They have strength and courage on the deen. And this is the trait of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, meaning steadfastness. No, steadfastness and, and, and not being ambiguous and not being uh, yani, just having one face. Then the third third trait is the trait of Uthman radiallahu anhu, which is haya, which is timidity. No, so that one is too too shy, one is too shy to do haram, one is too shy to go against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One is too shy to pray too late, for example. One is too shy to look at haram. So too shy to gossip about his co-scholars or, 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 or people nam, and so much more. And then also, and this is the one, sorry, is courage. So Umar radiallahu anhu was steadfastness. Is, is, is courage and wisdom, which is Ali radiallahu anhu. So they say that with these traits, the traits of, of Muhammad alayhi sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And the four khulafa, yani that one what, that one eventually will be a scholar of the hereafter.
Um, and uh, that, that is what one should try to do. But the main thing through which they distinguish themselves from all others, from, from other scholars, maybe, but definitely should be present, is that they act upon their knowledge. That they act upon their knowledge. They don't talk about the danger of gossiping and then gossip themselves. They don't uh, talk about envy and jealousy and then they're jealous themselves. They don't talk about bad behavior and there they are, insulting and losing their patience. So no, they are people of ilm and amal. They are people of knowledge and deeds. And watch out. Uh, scholars of the hereafter and the proof for a strong faith and a strong taqwa is not that you see someone cry or shiver in his or her prayer, but it is rather that someone stays away from haram. That someone stays away from haram. I mm. So um, this is what the, um, the, the, the scholars of the hereafter look like. So benefit should be sought from them as well as guidance from their righteous supplications for divine enablement and support to traverse uh, this path of worship with the help of God. So this is also very important. Like when you travel on your path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you ask um, uh, pious people to help you through their dua. And because the dua of, of pious people are accepted, if they make you dua for you, then be ibnillahi subhanahu wa ta'ala, yani your, your path to Allah will be facilitated. Um, and the Prophet وسلم, yani showed us whom we should be asking dua from. And he said, alayhi salatu wasalam, yani, look for the accept, accept, acceptance of your dua um, with the people with the most beautiful faces. And beautiful faces are meant radiant faces, yani faces uh, upon which the line, a light of iman Yani is visible. No? So ask them to make dua for you. Thus he acquires knowledge and certainty that he has a one God with no partners. He is the one who created him and bestowed upon him these blessings. He is the one who has enjoyed upon him to be thankful to him and has commanded him to have servitude towards him and worship him with both the, both the inner state and the outer state. So also very important. Like today, the emphasis is very often on the outward state and people are judged usually solely uh, by their community, by the way they look rather than by the way uh, they, they are on the inside. And that's because we can't see the inside. Huh? We can't see the inside of someone. And, uh, but, but the emphasis should be uh, very much on, on, on the state of the heart huh? because if the state of the heart is incorrect, then even if your deeds are in harmony with fiqh, then these uh, deeds might be rejected. No. So it says, um, does he acquires knowledge and certainty that he has one God with no partners? He is the one who created him and bestowed upon him these blessings. He is the one who has enjoined upon him to be thankful to him and has commanded him to have servitude towards him and worship him with both the inner and outer state. He is the one who has warned him of disbelief in the various types of sins. He is the one who has promised eternal award, award, sorry, reward if he worships him. He is also the one who has promised him with eternal torment if he disobeys him, dis disobeys him and turns away from him. With that, this knowledge and certainty of the unseen propels the servant to prepare for, the, for serving God. And to turn towards worship, to, to worship, worship of the master. Uh, I don't know if it says and to worship towards worship the master or to worship of the master. No. The one who bestows who he sought, found, and now knows after he was ignorant of him. Now we say after he has was ignorant of him. We see that in reality, yani he's talking about a stage which comes right after the stage of um, of knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but he was ignorant of the details, and he didn't know the names of his Lord. And this is why a lot of scholars say that some of the names, uh, uh, a human being might find out. Uh, might, might, he might know them. How, how might he know them? Just by looking at creation. Just by looking, this, just by looking at creation. 
And so, for example, you will know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the khaliq, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the wise, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the beautifier, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the majestic, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he should be wise. Uh, he knows that he knows and that he hears and that he sees and so many other names which might become apparent from just looking at creation but there were other names and attributes which he didn't know and 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 he knew about punishment and he knew about um, reward in this life but he didn't know about paradise and he didn't know about what and he didn't know about hell so in a, his ignorance was no longer the ignorance of the existence of the god almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala allah but rather about the details of that belief now, so with this knowledge and certainty of unseen propels the servant to prepare for the serving of uh, for for serving god and to turn towards the worship of the master the one who bestows who he sought found and now knows after he was ignorant of him However, he does not know how to worship him and what is enjoyed upon him in serving him. Um, uh, from the perspective, perspective of the outward state and inward state, thus after acquiring this knowledge of God, he strives and works hard until he learns what is enjoined upon him from the sacred law outwardly and inwardly. Okay, so that's the first obstacle. Your first obstacle, my first obstacle on the way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is knowledge. Now, without knowledge, everything falls, and without and with knowledge, everything stands. That that's how important knowledge is. So now he says, after doing that, at the very beginning, yani people have a lot of. They are driven. Now, they are driven by their enthusiasm, and and by by that new energy they find because they started practicing because they started, um, um, they, they got to know something new. So they are very devoted. They are very much um, striving forward. But at a certain point when, when the, the light yani, disappears and the energy calms down and, and the, yani, subhanAllah, you start to see these changes in yourself. That's now the point that Imam al-Ghazali says that you will get to. So, and then you come, and this is why he, he mentioned this one second in order. So the first one was yani, knowledge, and now there is the obstacle of repentance. He says, once he has perfected the knowledge and the apprehension of the obligate, obligatory acts, he is propelled to undertake the path of worship and to toil it in. Then he sees that, lo and behold, he is a perpetrator of many crimes and sins. This is the state of the most people. Thus he says, how do I progress unto worship uh, uh, while I'm persistent upon sinning, uh, tarnished by it? It is therefore incum incumbent, incumbent, incumbent upon me to repent from it, so that God forgives me for my sins and to cut me off from its shackles and to purify myself from its filth. Thus I become fit for serving God for the carpet of closeness. So... Here Imam al-Ghazali makes clear like the feeling of guilt. And I, I, I want to say something very, um, uh, I, I want to share a detail with regards to this. And you will understand what I mean. You will see that a lot of people repent because they feel guilty. And that's a repentance which will not take you away from the sin. And why, for example, you you, uh, you you tell yourself, I will be on a diet. Now I will be on a diet now. I need to lose weight. I need to lose 10, 15 kilos. Now, so now you do that because you feel guilty that you're overweight. Now, so that's a feeling of guilt. Or you, and, 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 and so when you start eating again, you feel guilty. So you're going now up. But the moment the feeling of guilt is gone, you will eat again. You see that? Oh, I didn't go to the gym. I feel guilty. Now I'm going to the gym again. Well, when I go to the gym, the feeling of guilt is gone. And after a while, I stop going to the gym. I memorize Quran. All of a sudden, I stop. I feel guilty. I want to get rid of that feeling of guilt. So I start memorizing again. It's up and down and up and down, meaning that you didn't, you were not able to find your true motivator. And guilt is not a motivator. 
Guilt is just an uneasy feeling you want to get rid of. No? Guilt is the uneasy feeling you want to get rid of. And the moment you get rid of it, you go back to what you were doing. No? And that, that's how it works. So when you sin, you don't repent because you feel guilty. You repent because you feel that you have betrayed the love of your maker for you and the friendship he is giving you and the, 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 the care and the way he takes care of you. You have betrayed your promise to him and you fear his anger, but you fear even more the loss of his love for you. And when this is your drive, you will not come back. You will not come back to your sin. But as long as, oh, I feel bad, I'm a bad Muslim, oh, because then it's still all about you. Repenting is not about you. So when we sin, we look at ourselves and then we become like discouraged. We, 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 become, we become very discouraged, for example. And we want to uh, then yani, give up. Uh, sorry, then we blame ourselves. We feel that we are filthy, that we are bad people, bad Muslims, and so much more. And then, okay, I'm going to get rid of it. Now, you're still turning yourself into the center of your worship. But now, if you know it's about Allah, then the reason behind your repentance and the reason behind you feeling bad will no longer be yourself. So the moment you can make that shift in, in, in the way you look at it, okay, then um, this is the state of, the mo of, of most of the people. Thus he says, how do I progress on to worship while I am persistent upon sinning, tarnished by it? It is therefore incumbent upon me to repent from it so that God forgives me for my sins and to cut me off from its shackles. Yani, because one is shackled by sins. Yani, when you, you sinned too much and you didn't repent enough, then you will feel that you are being slowed down in your worship. Now, then he says, here he is confronted with the obstacle of repentance. Without a doubt, he needs to traverse this path of repentance in order to reach what is intended from repentance. So he begins by establishing repentance with its due rights and conditions until he traverses this path. So inshallah, I'm going to stop here, inshallah. And uh, the two other ones, we're taking them with us to next week inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala um because i have to uh, uh take uh, late is a bit sick so we need to uh, look at what we will do with him so that's why i'm going to stop now inshallah five minutes early jazakumullah khairan may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you and inshallah i hope uh, the both both of the classes yani were beneficial and uh, inshallah next week we'll go to, we will continue barakallahu feekum wa jazakumullah khairan wa sallallahu wa sallam mubarak ala Sayyidina Habibina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you. Ameen. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sayyidina Salam.